What's up, y'all? Welcome into episode 66 of the Two Stripes Podcast, the podcast that covers everything happening in the world of college football. My name is Colton Denning, and I am your host, coming to you from sunny Oakland, California, about to transition into summer here, and I hope you are all having a wonderful start to your weekend as well, and want to thank you for tuning into today's show. I've got another 2019 season preview coming your way today. It's going to be about the Washington State Cougars, and I talked with Jeff Nusser of CougCenter.com, Washington State's SB Nation blog, and we'll get into that in a second, but I want to let the newer listeners know where to find the show, and that is SoundCloud.com slash Two Stripes Pod, or subscribing on Apple Podcasts, just search the Two Stripes Podcast and you can find every episode of the show there. You can also leave a review, leave some feedback, give me any sort of comments or just reviews on stuff I can do better to make this show better. That is always appreciated. I am also on Twitter, at DubsCo, and maybe most importantly, the show is on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Colton Denning, and not only will you find this in every episode of the show there, you will also find my college football highlights, which is a mix of new and current players and older players and historical highlights. Right now, I just posted up Justin Fields, the new Ohio State quarterback, his first action in Ohio Stadium at the spring game last week, as well as Garrett Wilson, their five-star receiver. So stuff like that is up, as well as some other players around the country. And also the older stuff, which is my favorite stuff, and these are some of the best players in college football history. I have 26 minutes of Ed Reed at Miami there, 17 minutes of Clinton Portis at Miami, 20 minutes of C.J. Spiller at Clemson, uh, Tashard Choice, Georgia Tech is up there, and then I have Mike Williams and Dwayne Jarrett, the two big USC receivers from the mid-2000s, and a couple more, and some really good Ohio State stuff there as well. So be sure to check that out. If you need something to get you through this last portion of the offseason as we kind of cruise closer towards fall practice, then I would recommend it, youtube.com slash Colton Denning. Anyways, with that out of the way, let's get into today's show. Last week, I spoke with Jeff Nusser, who is one of the contributors for SB Nation's Washington State blog, Coog Center, about Washington State and what they look like heading into 2019. We talked for about 30 minutes. This is a longer episode than I think I usually do, but I think it's chock full of knowledge and stuff about this Washington State team and this program that is an interesting look about where they are. Mike Leach is going on almost a decade there, which is really crazy to think about if you remember or were around for his tenure at Texas Tech, but he's been pretty firm there, and Washington State has just ripped off three or four consecutive solid seasons under him, and it seems like he has a pretty solid footing at Washington State, so it was cool to hear Jeff talk about that, what Leach's mentality is right now, where the program is, and whether or not they can ramp it up a little bit, whether they can take another step forward and beat Washington, get to the Pac-12 championship game, and anything else after that. I think I say this for all of the interviews I do, but I really enjoyed it, and Jeff is very knowledgeable about Washington State and everything going on in that program, so it's just, it's cool to get that point of view from somebody who knows the intricacies and the stuff and the roadblocks that a program like Washington State faces and how they're going to look in 2019. I know we're still a long ways off, but it's cool to get that early look here in April as we head closer to the season. With that being said, this is a perfect time to get right into it. Here is Jeff Nusser from KookCenter.com. I am stoked to be joined by one of the editors over at kookcenter.com, and his name is Jeff Nusser. Jeff, what's going on, man? Thanks for joining the show. Not much. It's uh, it's my I'm a teacher, so it's my spring break, and so, you know, life is good. Life is good. Uh, I promise we won't do this like a regular college football podcast about Washington State and 
have like 30 minutes of Mike Leach pirate talk. We're going <laughs> to we're going to stray elsewhere on this one, but I I'm super excited to get your perspective on the Cougars and everything happening with the program. And when you look back just to to 2018, it has to be one of the more successful seasons in recent program history. Washington State finishes 11 and 2, 31st in S&P Plus, and they beat Iowa State in the Alamo Bowl. Where does last year rank for you personally? And I guess just like however you can gauge general fan consensus on what last year was for the program. Yeah, you know, last year was, uh, you know, one of the better seasons in program history. Um, I, I think there's a consensus that it's just a kind of a notch below the best seasons. Uh, you know, those would be like um, 1997, 2002. Those were Pac-10 championship years and they went to the Rose Bowl. Um, so I, I think there's a thought that this was, you know, just a notch below that after uh, after losing to Washington and then, you know, n- not winning the Pac-12 championship. So uh, just a notch below that, but still... Um, just a super, super fun year. Um, and sometimes though the years that you don't expect, uh, to be really good are the years that you, that you really enjoy the most. And, and I think that's kind of what happened with us. Um, you know, it, most people know at this point that the guy that was uh, presumed to be the starting quarterback, Tyler Holinsky, um, died by suicide shortly after, uh, the previous season. And so th- there was just kind of this, like, you know, they were losing a bunch of starters. Uh, the guy who was supposed to be the quarterback had died. Um, th- there was just a lot of reasons to think that, that after you know three win three seasons of eight wins or more, um, that they were going to take a step back, and because that's kind of our program history, it's not a real, uh, it's not a program loaded with history and tradition, and so. Um, to be able to, you know, we just kind of thought, okay, we, we've had a good three-year run. Now it's time to maybe take a little step back and then we'll we'll get another step forward. Um, and then to have them just sort of have this incredible season um, where, you know, they they spent, you know, most of the last half of the season in the in the CFP talk. Um, it just was, it was a lot of fun. And I, and I think you kind of saw, you know, people I think saw some of the, you know, the Gardner Minshew, Mike Leach stuff, you know, after Colorado, Minshew runs up and puts a mustache on his face. I mean, that was just kind of indicative of the season as a whole. I think, you know, coaching up here had become a little bit of a grind for Leach. Uh, most people don't always see that, but it kind of seemed like it to me. I mean, there was the report that he was heading to Tennessee, or at least that Tennessee wanted him, you know, parlayed that into a into a raise. But um, there was, I think just for me, there was this sense that, you know, Leach was maybe kind of looking around like, you know, okay, have I done everything I can do here? Um, and then last season was just so much fun. There, there was kind of a, even a noticeable change in his um, his affect. So, um, so yeah, just, a, just an all around fun season. You know, it sucks that we lost to Washington again. Um, that gets old, but other than that, man, everything else was great. Gardner Minshew was it was a ton of fun, and and uh, you know this is really what we envisioned when when Leach came was you know these really you know popping up with these great seasons with you know a quarterback who just sort of shreds everybody, and um, so we're we're excited about the state of the program. I like that you brought up the 2002 team. Not a lot of people talk about them. Devar Darling, one of my absolute favorites. If you don't know Devar Darling. Uh, learn yourself. I don't think any of his highlights are on YouTube, but that's that's my guy. And I, I like that you brought up Leach and sort of the grind that college coaching is. And, and that's obviously something that isn't just specific to him. You see it even at places where guys have a ton of success that, you know, you stay for 10 years and you're either a legend or you go out unceremoniously somehow He's going into year eight. What's the overall temperature of of his tenure there? And they've been pretty consistent the last four years, nine and four in 2015, eight and five, and then nine and four 2017, and then of course 11 and two last year. What's his long-term future like at Washington State and, and how are people feeling about his tenure? At this point, I think fans would be ecstatic to have him as long as he wants to stay. You know, there's a small, you know, there's there's a certain segment of fans that are never going to be happy, right? I mean, I think you know that pretty well. <laughs> so it's yeah, like, for sure. Yeah. So you know, I mean, there's always a certain segment that's going to be like, you know, why can't we do this? And so for our fans, it's you know, why can't we beat Washington? And because um, that really sucks. And sort of a unique dynamic of of uh, of our rivalry out here is that you know most of our fans like me um, live in the greater Seattle area, so we work around a lot of Huskies. And so we, you know, never hear the end of it uh, when when we lose to Washington. And so it, it makes it kind of weird that way and people get tired of it. But, um, you know, you just can't argue with with the sustained success. And I mean, I know four seasons of eight or more wins in a row um, probably doesn't sound like much to most uh, most fans, particularly, you know, Ohio State fans. Right? I mean, it's like you're used to a certain level well, for us. Like, I mean, to be able to we've never had a run 
a four year run like this. And I know like for people that don't pay attention, you know, and there's no reason they would necessarily pay attention. It's like, yeah, like this is, this is special and unique and different and um, really unprecedented. Um, you know, obviously we've had the peaks, right? I mean, I talked about the two championships, but you know, the first one, 97, that's when I was in school. Uh, you know, they dropped off pretty quickly after that. Um, didn't go to another bowl game until 2001. So, um, you know, it's just sort of, you know, this is great. And, and I think people are pretty, you know, with all things considered, the program history and everything else, uh, people are pretty excited about Leach. They'd love for him to stay. They're excited about the state of the program. I mean, they get, most people saw what we did at game day. Um, I was there for that. And it was as, you know, bananas as it looked on TV. You know, people just feel real good. Our donations are up. Uh, you know, there's more demand for season tickets. I think um, things are moving in a positive direction, and 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 our fans certainly aren't uh, aren't tired of Leach yet, for sure. Yeah, Ohio State's been 25 and three the last two years with right. uh, the, the Cotton Bowl win and the Rose Bowl win, and I've been miserable. Right. And right. and it helps put in it helps put it in, into perspective. And honestly, just makes me feel like a jerk for for you feeling know, so miserable at success. We're uh, so I'm also I have season tickets to the Seahawks too, and so it's kind of like that out here with them. It's like, well, we won one Super Bowl, so how come we haven't won three? You know, I mean, it's just yeah, it's just you know, it's it's people. Some people are just going to be unhappy no matter what you do. And, and I've sort of committed, you know, during this run to just be like, man, it's, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't last forever at Washington state. You know, I mean, I lived through, you know, like I said, two Rose Bowls with Mike Price, Tony Bennett, you know I mean? And it's, it's just like, these things don't last forever. And so I, I think any fan is, is wise to, to really enjoy the good times because uh, they definitely don't last forever. Yeah. And I, I think that's a, that's a, the thing at a program like Washington state. And I don't mean that in a derisive way, just it, when you talk about college football, there's the power teams and then there's obviously a rung and then multiple rungs beneath that. And when you go nine and four, eight and five, nine and four, and then 11 and two, the natural inclination as a fan is, okay, we went 11 and two, what's the next step? And it doesn't always work out that way, but it's clear that he has set a sustained bar of success there. And like you're saying, it, it hasn't really been like that in the past. Yeah. I just, I think there's a reality, right? Like I think most, you know, I think most fans of most programs are pretty aware of where they fit in there. You know, it's going to be real hard for us to break through to that next level as long as Peterson's at Washington. That's a big thing. Um, he's just a really great coach, you know. And the other part is the way he builds his program is just a really natural really natural foil for what we do, um, which sucks. It's like, you know, if we had lost to USC for, you know, all these, all these years, um, you know, we just go, well, you know, it's USC or whatever, but it just, it sucks that it's Washington, right? That Washington's this gorilla that we have such a hard time with, with the way they build their pass defense and all of these things, you know, but it, there's, there's just a reality. I mean, for as much success as we've had, you know, the recruiting classes are still in the forties and fifties. Um, you know, it's when you get on the field with, you know, truly elite athletes that are well coached, Coached, um, you really do sort of see the difference. Now, fortunately, in the in the and maybe unfortunately, depending on if you're a Pac-12 fan, but um, the conference as a whole maybe is a little bit down. You know, people aren't being being coached as well as uh, as they have been in the past, and and so you know it, that has allowed you know Mike Leach to to maybe elevate. Wazoo's program and, and make it more competitive than than it otherwise would be. The big story on Washington State heading into this season is quarterback, and you already talked about Gardner Minshew and what he brought to the program and now replacing him after one year. What's the read like for them at quarterback right now? What's that competition shaping up to be like? So they took another grad transfer. Uh, this was Gage Gabrud from Eastern Washington University, so uh, an FCS program. Um, a guy that Mike Leach is really, really familiar with because we've played them twice in the last three years. Um, three years ago, lost to him uh, when he had Cooper Cup to throw to. So now Los Angeles Ram Cooper Cup. And so, you know, he shredded us pretty good in that game um, as a sophomore. And then this past year, um, we beat them up pretty good um, at Martin Stadium again. And uh, he, he eventually went down later in the season with, a, with a, I think, a toe injury um, and ended up doing a grad transfer thing again, uh, like, like Minshew did, um, and also had to get a, an NCAA uh, medical hardship waiver, which he eventually got on appeal. So he was coming in, and he actually came in this semester and was going to participate in spring practices. And then in a, uh, a workout drill before practices actually had started, he uh, tweaked his ankle or something. Um, so he hasn't fully participate in practices all the last couple I believe he's done just a little bit of light throwing so I think there's I think there's a an, an assumption that he's kind of the front runner um, you know you don't 
necessarily take on a guy like that unless you you really envision him uh, being the starter. Although the two guys that are behind him, Trey Tinsley, uh, Anthony Gordon, they are uh, redshirt seniors, lots and both of them uh, junior college transfers, um, lots and lots of experience practicing the system last couple of years. Um, so they're the guys taking all the reps, but but I think there's a belief the Gabrud will be the guy. Um, the the one guy everybody was kind of looking at to take a step forward was Cameron Cooper. Uh, he was an Elite 11 quarterback. Mike Leach's first Elite 11 quarterback that he recruited, four-star kid. Um, really kind of seemed to struggle picking up the offense as a freshman um, and seems to be definitely a step behind uh, the seniors. So I think there's a feeling that he really needs, if he's going to do it at all, he really needs another year um, of practice and, and just reps. And then there's a true freshman who came in this spring, Gunnar Cruz, which is perhaps the best air raid quarterback name in history. Um, he came in and, and he's, he's learning too. So I think there's a feeling that a year from now, it, you know, when, when Gabrud and, and Tinsley and Gordon have all graduated, uh, that it's really going to be Cooper and, and Cruz that are going to be battling it out to take over. I'm looking forward to seeing Gage Gabrud play just to hear other fan bases lament about how they're getting their asses kicked by a guy named Gage Gabrud. That's, yeah, that should be that's what I'm super excited for. And uh, earlier on, you talked about how Minshew and kind of not not even just the on-field stuff but just his demeanor and presence kind of changed the way Mike Leach felt and and kind of took away a little bit of the grind that he may have been experiencing being this deep in his stay in Pullman do you think that that style and that sort of for lack of a better word swag and presence that Minshew played with has changed the type of quarterback that Leach looks for or, or covets in that offense? I mean, I don't think so. I think, you know, Leach has kind of a set of principles that, um, you know, that he subscribes to when he's thinking about who can be his quarterback. Uh, number one is accuracy when he throws. Um, if you, you know, if you can't do that, you're going to, you're going to really struggle in the air raid, particularly because so many of the throws are kind of short and they got to be kind of in the right spot. Um, otherwise the, the receiver can't really do anything with it. So, so there's that personality wise, you know, I, I don't know that he necessarily has a type and I think he understands that, you know, there's different ways to get where you're going. I, I mean, if you, you know, Minshew, this, this is the one thing I think, you know, keep trying to tell people as far as Gabrud goes, it's like, look, you know, Minshew was, was special and he was a, just a different dude. And it's like, you know, it, I mean, the guy, the, the last picture we we saw of him, he was back in Pullman uh, at a pra at a spring practice last week and was wearing, it was 50 degrees out and kind of rainy. Um, and he's out there wearing jorts and a hoodie and aviator sunglasses, you know, and it, it, he's just a different, just a different dude. And that's why, you know, people liked him so much as teammates really gravitated towards him. I, I just don't think you can try and replicate that, you know, so I think you just, you know, you try and get a guy who can lead. Um, I think that's obviously part of it. And, and other than that, you know, you look for a guy with the physical tools and, and the ability to make decisions quickly, you know, that's kind of the other piece. And, and that's really where, you know, Minshew could have come in with, with the jorts and the, you know, whatever, which he did, you know, last August, um, you know, he could have showed up with all that stuff and, you know, if he couldn't throw and, and if he couldn't, you know, run the offense, um, none of that was going to matter. And, you know, the big thing with him was he had been, you know, a child of the air raid for, you know, really like kind of 10 years, uh, you know, starting from when he was like about 12 years old, um, and ran. And, you know, ran an air raid system in junior college and ran, you know, a system with some air raid elements at East Carolina. So, you know, so he was ready to go. Gabrud, you know, that's going to be the interesting thing. Uh, you know, definitely didn't run an air raid offense at, at Eastern. So, you know, there's going to be I'm um, going to be a learning curve there a little bit. And so that that's kind of the biggest thing, you know, I'm interested in. And um, I, I just think there's different ways to get where you're going. You know, Luke Falk was really the opposite of Gardner Minshew in pretty much every possible way. Um, and he was pretty successful for a few years. So, so yeah, I just, you know, I think he looks kind of make sure the physical tools are there, make sure there's enough leadership. And then, uh, and then you go from there. Outside of quarterback, Washington State's also going to have to replace tackle Andre Dillard, who it, it looks like is going to be like a top 15 pick now. Yeah and running back James Williams. Are those the two other kind of big stories on how guys behind them or maybe in the offensive line case, somebody moving over from guard, whatever it may be, what what is the rest of the offense shaping up to be like in 2019? Yeah, I think the uh, I think the offensive line is the lesser concern. Um, they've done a really great job over the years, you know, just kind of plugging guys in. They one of the things they do that a lot of people I think don't realize is you know they they take five or six offensive linemen every single class, um, and those aren't guys that you know maybe they'll play offense, maybe they'll play defense. I mean, these are offensive 
offensive lineman every single class. And so um, they just they it's I think that's a nod to Leach recognizing that, you know, they really can't do anything if they don't have competition and line play. And so what they've really had for the last, you know, three, four, five years is, you know, when somebody graduates and you start to go, oh man, you know, what's going to happen? And this isn't, you know, knock on Dillard. I mean, he's, you know, he's been incredible. Um, but, you know, we also, we lost an NFL draft pick before Dillard that played that position, a guy named Joe Dahl who plays for the Detroit Lions now. You know, it's like, oh man, Joe Dahl's leaving. What are we going to do? And then Dillard comes in and Dillard's great. You know I mean? Just, so I think they'll be fine on, on the offensive line. I think, you know, they'll definitely find somebody in there. Running back's a little... That one's a little dicier. Um, they've they've kind of they've had a a few recruits wash out over the last couple of years at running back, um, partly because there just wasn't a lot of opportunity to play for a lot of those guys. Um, so now you know James Williams leaving. James Williams is was fantastic in the air raid. I mean, he had this uncanny ability to make the first guy miss um, as a pass catcher, and so. Uh, really, really, you know, stellar talent. Now, the guy who paired with him last year was a kid named Max Borgie, uh, who is um, was a true freshman and is great, um, shifty, strong, uh, great pass catcher, but but really just kind of really excellent vision as a running back. Um, you know, in a lot of ways might think you know was was maybe the better of the two. I mean, I know that's that's maybe a little bit of a controversial opinion, but I think he was certainly every bit James Williams equal. Just you know maybe not with as much experience. I, you know, as long as he stays healthy, we're good. You know, Leach really likes to rotate running backs, um, so it's you know it's. It, we would love to have another guy that we know we could count on right now. We're not sure what we've got. Um, I think going into the fall, the backup actually is going to be a kid named Jameer Thomas, who's from uh, Massillon. Um, so I think he's going to be the backup guy. Everybody in the Midwest was recruiting him as a linebacker. Washington State said, we'll let you be a running back. And so he went ahead and, and came out West. So he's going to be an interesting kid to watch. Um, as long as Borgie stays healthy, I think they'll be, they'll be fine. They'll be able to rotate a couple other guys in and, and that'll be fine. Um, and then the other thing is that the wide receivers, and this is as deep and stacked a wide receiver core as Mike Leach has maybe ever had. Um, and that's, I know going way back. Um, they are just, they are legitimately two to three deep at, at really every position. Um, and so that's, you know, it's, it's hard to single out any one guy, but Desmond Patman is probably the guy I would look at to have a major, major breakout season. He's like about six, three, two twenty. He's a, he's a specimen plays outside on the right. So him and maybe Tay Martin on the left, um, those two guys are, are the guys you would look for. Flipping over to the defense, you look at the last three years and the Cougars have finished 59th, 30th and 60th in defensive S and P plus what makes what's the formula for a successful defense at Washington State and with the way that Mike Leach wants to play? Yeah, you know, you're never gonna get um, you know, the big wreckers that that, you know, that Ohio State gets or USC gets or Washington gets. You know, we're not gonna get those guys for the most part. Um, so what we've really focused on, and you're obviously familiar with this with Alex Grinch coming out there, um, you know, speed, really focusing on speed and and maybe guys are lighter, um, but but they're gonna be able to run and run and run. And and you know, sometimes that work doesn't work um, in places because you know it's it's hard to let speed run if you know if guys are getting blocked or whatever. Um, and so what they've really focused on is this sort of penetrating style of defense on on the on the defensive line, um, and it's worked out really really well for them. Um, you know, so they they just focus on you know just these one gap schemes where where guys just go and they get into a gap and they disrupt things, um, and and they've had a ton of success with it. You know, Hercules Mataafa was a All American a couple of years ago, um, ended up you know going. And pro and, and signing as an undrafted free agent with the Vikings. Um, you know, so that that's kind of how they've done it. You know, just just penetrate, be disruptive. Um, you know, they blitz. You know, they blitzed a lot last year under Tracy Clays, who was the the new uh, defensive coordinator, took over for Alex Grinch, um, and and things went really really well. So, you know, I think they they what they really do really well under Mike Leach, just as a whole as a program, is they really are good at playing to their strengths. They're really good at finding guys who can do the things that they want them to do, that they need them to do, and then just letting them go do that thing. And so. Um, you know, defensively that that's kind of it, you know, they, uh, they got exposed a little bit, uh, with the pest defense last year, cause it was a little bit of a shift from Grinch Grinch liked a, uh, kind of play these umbrella shells with the DBs and then, um, just sort of rally and tackle really a very much a bend, but don't break. 
um, Clay's wanted to put more uh, more emphasis on, on on playing sort of physically um, on the outside with the corners, and and that led to them getting abused uh, from time to time. And so they really made that a, a a huge focus in recruiting. So there's a whole bunch of JC kids they brought in. Most of them are six one or bigger uh, as DBs, and so that that would be sort of a big shift if anybody was was watching any of our games this year. That would be a thing to look out for is uh, the bigger guys playing on the outside um, being asked to do to be really physical. Looking at just overall stuff earlier, you, we've we've talked a little bit about Washington, and we gotta we gotta address it here. They haven't beaten Washington since two thousand twelve. Two thousand twelve, and it took a miracle to do that one. What what's the next? <laughs> is this the next hurdle, and and how does it happen? Yeah, you know there are a lot of uh, a lot of Husky fans that that don't want to hear this, but um, you know, I mean, I don't know what would have happened this year's game if it hadn't snowed, and and I know that sounds whatever, you know, people will be like sour grapes or whatever, but you know, yeah, that that is the next thing they got to be able to compete with with the gorilla, you know, and Washington's that, and and I really think they had a legitimate chance to do it this year, and you know, if you're trying to throw the ball sixty times, uh, playing in a snow and a blizzard is probably not the best way to do it. So um, they really just kind of got, you know, I think a little bit unlucky. They may still have lost. They may have still gotten whipped. You know, I don't know. But, um, you know, but the snow was really a hindrance to what we wanted to do on offense. And then defensively, when you're light like we are, um, that makes it, you know, much easier for for the other side to push you around. So, um, yeah, that's definitely the next big thing. That's definitely the thing that, that we're looking forward to is, you know, hopefully maybe Washington takes a little bit of a step back this year. Uh, maybe we can maintain our level. Um, and maybe, maybe for once, finally, finally get those flipping guys. So I don't have to listen to it at work. Uh, how much of a distaste do Washington State fans have for Jimmy Lake? I hate him. <laughs> I hate him. I, I figured that because I remember I didn't watch much of that game, but I remember the quotes yeah. after the yeah. game, and I was like, "That's definitely going to set up next year to uh, to have a little bit." If there wasn't already enough emotion yeah. and hostility, next year is going to be a lot of fun. He's actually been running his mouth like that for a few years. Um, I just think it hasn't really escaped the Northwest. Um, yeah, I mean, look, when you win, you know, you can say whatever you want, I guess. Um, you know, what gets a little old is it's like, okay, well, you know, you're you're so great, you know, you're riding the coattails of Chris Peters, and I'm sure that's, you know great good you know good for you let's let's see what you do when you go out and get your own program he wasn't exactly a stellar coach before he got to boise state he got fired by the i think the tampa bay buccaneers twice if i remember right so um you know it's uh uh you know coaching under uh chris peterson it's kind of like coaching under saban right i mean you're gonna or urban meyer i mean you're gonna look very very good doing that you know and so that's that's kind of that's kind of where i'm at with that guy and all right go take a job somewhere and then let's see how those guys do I just love some good old fashioned college football hate and ass right, comments. Right. Thank you for bringing that to me. That's the energy that I need <laughs> in April. Like the spring game isn't enough on on the Ohio State podcast. I do. We were we were talking about the spring game, and I compared it to like eating twelve bagel bites, where it's like, yeah, it'll last you for thirty minutes, but after that, you, you yeah. want something more. So it's stuff like that that I need to get me hyped for the season. So la- last question for you here: we've we've talked about what last year was, eleven and two, and how successful uh, the Cougars have been in the last four seasons. What are expectations for two thousand nineteen, and what do you what do you think is a reasonable expectation for them? We're a long way off. But just from your 30,000 foot perspective, what what are you looking for for them next season? I think just sort of continuing along the same path. I mean, I, I you know, it, it's hard to, I, I mean, listen, I was a guy who thought last year they were headed for four wins. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, we lost Luke Falk, we lost Mata Avo, we lost, we lost like half our coaching staff, we, you know, whatever. I mean, all this stuff, um, you know, it was pretty wild, everything that all the, all the, you know, challenges that they face. Obviously, you know, the quarterback died. I mean, that affects, you know, that affects a team in profound ways. And, and so I just kind of thought, you know, hey, they're, you know, nobody would blame them if this year really sucked. Um, and then all of a sudden it didn't, right? And, you know, as, as the year went on, I kind of had to sit there and think, well, you know, I mean, you know, why, why, you know, and, and really it's, um, you know, the answer I keep coming back to is Mike Leach. And, you know, with that guy, you just can't, you can't ever count out 
um, his team. I mean, they're just, he is such a good coach. And I know that, you know, so much gets, I know that the, the you know, the national perception of him is, um, you know, wacky Mike Leach, right? I mean, what's he going to say next? Is he going to, is he going to talk about pirates? Is he going to give them dating advice? Is he going to, you know, I mean, it's, it's all this and, <laughs> you know, and I get it, you know, for people who are not around the program, um, you know, I get that that's, that's what you see, right? I mean, you turn on game day and it's, you know, deep thoughts with Mike Leach. I mean, you know, it's all this stuff. Um, but as someone who's, you know, close ish to the program, I mean, I'm not in Pullman. I don't, you know, go to a lot of practices. I don't, you know, that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I don't get to really see it up, up close. Um, but just as someone who obviously watches every game and, you know, has followed the program very closely for, you know, basically 25 years now, um, they, he, he's just a really, really, really good coach and an excellent leader. And it doesn't matter which assistants come and go, and it doesn't matter which players come and go. Um, the culture is set. And he knows what he wants to do and he knows what to expect and he's really good at communicating it and he's really good at um, getting his coaches to communicate that. And, and so that's all just a really long answer to say. I mean, I expect, you know, something between eight and 10 wins. Like that's, I think, where, I mean, I, I don't know at this point after last year, I don't know why I would expect um, anything different, you know, with the, with the foundation that's been laid. Um, there's still a ton of talent, you know, most of the time, I know that there's, you know, the big losses of Minshew and Dillard, um, you know, people point to that Taylor comfort was our nose tackle, um, really underrated guy, you know, losing him is, is not great, but it's also like, you know, there's a ton of talent returning. So, you know, eight to 10 wins, I think would really be the expectation. Um, you know, not that anything less than that would be a supreme failure, but I mean, when you go into a season, you just kind of think, okay, well, what's reasonable? I mean, th that's sort of what's been demonstrated over the last, you know, four years is eight to 10 wins and maybe even more is, is, is reasonable to expect. And it seems like every time Washington state gets counted out before the season, they just have, they have a very good year. And that is kind of what it felt like just being an outsider from them the last three or four seasons is they lose a quarterback or they, they lose a talented receiver or something. And it's, ah, can Leach really keep doing this? And then the season starts and USC has to go into Pullman. They get smacked around. They pull off a couple more upsets and then just play consistent all year. And at the end of the year, you're like, wow, what? Washington State's 9-4. and four. Wow, that, they had a really good year. And I, I think that that goes back to what we were talking about with consistency, that this is just kind of what they are right now and why I think – Anyone, not just Washington State fans, when when you look at Washington State, should be like, yeah, they're they're going to win eight, nine, or ten games. And with the way that the Pac-12 is right now, it, it's so up in the air. And there are teams that you would historically think like, wow, there's no reason for this team not to win the conference. USC, namely that one, it, it just feels like, hey, in this era, it's open. And also goes back to getting over that hurdle in, in Washington. And I know I'm super excited, not only for that game, but for the rest of the season to, to see what they do because there's a lot of new pieces. But as you said, there's also a lot coming back that I don't think people are talking about. Yeah, the power definitely resides in the North in the Pac-12. Uh, you know, so it's, it, it's going to be a crazy fight um, up in the North between Washington and, you know, Oregon. I mean, they seem to be on the upswing with Cristobal. It's tough to say, um, but they may have, you know, the best quarterback in the conference and Herbert, um, Stanford is Stanford. They've been down for a couple of years. It's going to be interesting to see how Shaw kind of deals with that. Shaw, <laughs> that was kind of one of the more satisfying things was that win last year. David Shaw, it seemed like we kind of broke him because this is like three years in a row now that we've beaten Stanford. Um, and so it's, he's kind of like, you know, I don't know what I have to do to beat these guys, um, which is, which is totally great. You know, and then Cal, obviously, um, I think they may still be, you know, kind of a year away under Justin Wilcox, but um, the defense is no joke. Um, that defense is legit. So, um, so yeah, the North, the North is stacked and, and, you know, but it definitely helps, um, you know, when, you know, the times that Washington State has really been good. And th this is what's been kind of weird for our fans. You kind of have to retrain yourself on expectations because it's been kind of this series of you peak and then you take like five steps backwards. And then you peak and then you take like five steps backwards. And and really the only time that didn't happen was, you know, the 2002 Rose Bowl season. Um, you know, 2003, they won 10 games again, ended with a Holiday Bowl win over a top five team in Texas. You know, it's kind of like, okay, you know, we've turned this thing around. Well, then we took, you know, three steps back and then we took 10 more steps back under Paul Wolf. Um, you know, we're kind of used to that, those kinds of cycles. And, you know, Leach has really um, done a great job of kind of establishing that consistency. And then, you know, stepping into a void. I mean, 
USC has been down. UCLA is down. Um, Oregon's been down for a couple of years. Um, you know, those kinds of things really help when a program such as Washington State that that historically has been, you know, definitely in the the second or third tier of the conference um, definitely helps when when those programs are down a little bit, um, allows us to, to maybe step into that void and, and have some success that, you know, historically maybe um, we haven't had. And then I think now going forward, it's been built to the point where, you know, even if those programs are good. Um, you know, we should be able to still, you know, compete with those programs, um, given the way that, that Leach has established the program, both in terms of talent, which again, not, not elite talent, but certainly, um, the kind of talent that allows you to compete year in and year out. And then, um, you know, just the philosophy and the tools that he has. Uh, well, if I can make one plea to Washington state fans, it's please save all of us from another Washington, Utah PAC 12 championship, because I was in attendance this year and let me tell you it, it was worse than it was on tv yeah. i can assure you that and i it was a, a bad game and not bad in the way that that tcu yeah. cal yeah. cheese it bowl was whoa that is rough yeah that's we you know we we'd really 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 like to do our part this year <laughs> that'd be nice well hopefully they can make it and if they do and whatever they do the best place to keep up with everything Washington State Athletics is over at CougCenter.com and you can follow them on Twitter at CougCenter. And Jeff, where can they catch all your work? Uh, just CougCenter.com and at CougCenter. I don't have a Twitter handle anymore, so just right there is fine. Smart man. I've talked to a couple people that have done that and uh, that is that is the move in 2019, yeah, it's, I think. It's but- not as it's not that bad. <laughs> I'll be honest. <laughs> I, have, I waste a lot less time arguing with people about very stupid things. That is a good way to live life. I can definitely say that for sure. But make sure to go to kookcenter.com. And if you are on Twitter, like the rest of us losers, follow them on Twitter at Coog Center. Jeff, this was a lot of fun, man. I'm, I always have fun with these preview episodes and getting to know more about Washington State is, is always a blast. And like I said at the start, we weren't going to do a lot of pirate talk, and I'm glad we I'm glad we de- dove a little bit deeper than that. No problem, man. <laughs> Shout out to Jeff for joining the show and dropping all of that insight into the Cougars and everything going on with that program. It's always newsworthy, and it's always fun watching what Mike Leach teams do because almost every year, like we said, seems like they're – counted out by a lot of people and at the end of the year there they are at nine and four so i will be keeping a close eye on washington state this year to see what they do with the new quarterback a new running back new left tackle and some other pieces there but it's hard to doubt mike leach with what his track record is i also hope my good friends over at uw dog pound didn't get too upset with me for doing this interview they've always been great friends to the show and it was cool to get the opposite perspective from that rivalry which is one of the best in the country and doesn't get enough doesn't get the pub that it should because it's a fun rivalry and I always like seeing those two fan bases go at it that's a lot of good old fun hate between Washington State and Washington especially after what Jimmy Lake said Stuff like that is why these season previews are so much fun to record, to hear these fan bases talk not only about their teams, but about their rival programs as well. And I'm starting to get fired up for it. The new season is ever so slowly getting closer. We're just over four months away. The season preview magazines are about to start hitting the shelves. Bill Conley from SB Nation has his team previews going out almost daily. I think he's 50 some odd teams in. So if you need to do some catching up, I would highly recommend checking out all of those. He is the best in college football at that. And I know I've been reading those and been checking out all of the athletics college football coverage. There really is not a shortage right now of great college football coverage. So if I can provide just even a little slice of that for you as we get through this offseason, then I'll have done my job here. So I hope you guys enjoyed this show and all of the other shows I've done. And there's still more to come. So keep an eye out. SoundCloud.com slash Two Stripes Pod. Two Stripes Podcast on Apple. And I am on Twitter at DubsCo. And once again, check out the YouTube channel. I promise you will love it. There's some great college football highlights up there, youtube.com slash Colton Denning. Until the next time I talk with you guys, though, I want to thank you once again for listening. I hope you all have a great and safe weekend. And until next time, my name is Colton Denning, 
and this is the Two Stripes Podcast.